<clears throat> Hello, and welcome to the 14th installment of Goss. Reads Goss. Menace in the Goldilocks Zone. Dum, dum, dum. We're on chapter 14. Uh, we got out of Lucky 13 last time. And uh, as you may recall, the, uh, our intrepid gang of adventurers is on Arborea, and they are trying to... Uh, buy a larger ship so that they can uh, <clears throat> pass unnoticed uh, by the Eredians because the Eredians just can't help but uh, pull them over so to speak uh, so as we've been doing before uh, we're going to read the last few paragraphs of chapter 13 before it's starting chapter 14 true to his word Burrison soon appears with the rest of the crew some of whom bear sacks of colorful fruit we found a shopkeeper who spoke a little mare urban, gathered Amsel's Roger. She told us about these fruits and was very helpful in suggesting the ones we might like. We bought some to share around the evening meal tonight, Lutterson adds. Well, something to look forward to, Roger replies gamely. At least some of us have accomplished something today. <clears throat> so chapter 14, Fire on the Water. The next morning confronts Roger with time and no productive way to spend it. He unpacks his paints and canvas, thinking to compose a meditation on the sky terror, but finds himself unable or unwilling to apply paint to the blank form before him. He puts them aside for a midday meal, returning determined to compose an ode to the sky catchers, but again a composition eludes him. The shadows grow long, and he finally begins applying paint for yet another idea. A bat biting satire of Arborean society, tentatively titled The Many-Headed Beast. The next morning finds him working steadily at the same composition when his goggles indicate someone calling his name. Mr. Roger, come quick. There's an Arborean here, and we don't know what he's saying. Roger moves from behind his screen of shipping containers to seeing Nowerdam and Lutterson waiting uncomfortably with Broadtrunk, who, from the presence of the empty transport vehicle, appears to have come along. Chieftain Broadtrunk, Roger greets him with surprise. This is an unexpected honor. I'm afraid it's not honor that brings me here, Broadtrunk replies grimly, but grief, Rotvine, has died. <clears throat> Roger is momentarily wordless with, with the news. When? How? He finally manages to ask. Last night, Broadtrunk reports, in his sleep, evidently, at least his passing was peaceful. The chieftain appears to make an effort to compose himself. I went to visit him after we spoke, he says eventually. He told me of your kindness to him, all of your kindness, he adds, looking to at the Mare Urbans. I have come to ask if you will participate in his funeral rites. Most of his friends have preceded him, and I don't want him to go to the river unattended. I will come, of course. As for the others, I will ask them, but I am sure they will as well. When will they take place? <clears throat> Pardon me. Our custom is to hold the ritual at sunset. I will send a transport for you this afternoon. He prepares to mount his own transport and pauses. How many will you be? Eight, Roger replies, if we all come. I will send morning robes with the transport, <clears throat> the Arborian says, taking the driver's seat. I doubt you have any of your own. No, no we don't. Thank you, Roger says. This is very sad news. Yes, yes it is, Broadtrunk agrees. Until sunset then, <clears throat> pardon me. He starts up the transport and drives away. I'm getting a little choked up too. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Roger turns to Nowerdam and Lutterson. Please ask everyone to meet me at the dining table as soon as possible, he says simply. I have some distressing news. The crew assembles anxiously, all looking expectantly at Roger, who says nothing until Forge Dam and Peregrine arrive, looking grim. I've asked you all here <clears throat> to give you some bad news, Roger says finally. Rotvine has died. To a person, the assembled breathe 
a collective sigh of relief. Oh, is that all, Forge Dem says. I thought you were going to tell us that Broadtrunk couldn't help us. Or that the calamity we fear has struck, Peregrine adds. Although, she amends quickly, th this is very sad news. Yes, Forge Dem agrees just as quickly. Very sad indeed. Yes, Roger says in consternation. I suppose there could be worse nudes, he adds, still taken aback by their response. At any rate, we have been asked to attend the funeral rites at sunset today. Broad Trunk is very kindly providing transportation and appropriate attire. Attire? Forge then asks. We have to wear clothes? Well, evidently yes, Roger says. Broad Trunk says he will provide us with robes. It's just for the ritual, I imagine, Forge Dem says. Yes, Roger says again. <clears throat> I gather they are a sign of mourning. Well, as sorry as I am to hear of Rudfine's death, Forge Dem says, I can't honestly say I mourn the fellow. I only met him the one time. <clears throat> Broadtrunk told me that Rudfine was very grateful for the kindness we showed him, Roger explains. He also told me that Rudfine had very few friends left to show their respects. How did he put it? He did not want Rotvine to go to the river unattended. Well, it's not as if we have pressing matters to attend to this evening, Gatherdam observes. I, for one, am happy to pay my respects. Even if it does mean I have to wear clothes. As am I, Forgedam declares. The rest of the party, including Forgedam, murmurs their agreement. Roger turns to Peregrine. I would understand if you felt it imprudent for you to attend, he says. No, Peregrine replies without hesitation. I will attend. It is late afternoon when a transport driven by the Orborian that had been Roger's guide at Broadtrunk's house arrives with a set of eight dark hooded robes whose backs are embroidered with the, the images of red flames hovering over a flowing silver river. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the robes are evidently of the one-size-fits-no-one variety, <clears throat> as the mayor urbans are swallowed in them and they are absurdly short for peregrine <clears throat> for his part roger thinks he probably looks like a draped table and chair nonetheless they all solemnly board the transport and sit quietly as the guide steers them through what passes as streets in that town they draw little attention as they do so people apparently seeing only the robes and not who wears them they eventually arrive at an ornate building with a grand causeway to the entrance which is flanked by tall staley decorated in the same river and flame motif as the robes. A platform supporting the bier and Rotvine's body wait at the foot of the causeway, along with a robed broad trunk and several other members of his household staff. There are no other mourners. <clears throat> Chieftain Broadtrunk, Roger says, once they had all disembarked. This is Paragon. Captain Forgedam, First Officer Burroson, Second Officer Nowerdam, and crew members Gatherdam, Lutterson, and Forgedam. Thank you all for coming, the Chieftain greets them. It means a great deal to me that you came. Rotvine and I were old friends. We shared many passions. His passing is quite the blow. We are honored to share your burden of mourning, Peregrine assures him as Roger translates for the Mayor Urbans. <clears throat> Broadtrunk looks at Peregrine curiously for a long moment then turns to roger as if to speak he evidently changes his mind and turns back to peregrine it is we rotvine and i who are honored he says would you do us the additional honor of helping to carry the beer into the temple of course peregrine nods admiral captain if you would be kind enough to assist as well yes roger replies and translates for forge them of course forge them responds i thank you Broadtrunk nods to them. It now occurs to me that you may want to know what to expect and what is expected of you. Roger translates this as well, and there are murmurs of assent. Rodvine abhorred elaborate ceremony, Broadtrunk explains. So the ritual will be simple. We will carry the body into the temple as the sun sets and place it on the crematory altar. Anyone who wishes to speak some words of rem anyone who wishes to will speak some words of remembrance and i will make some final remarks and those of us who carried the beer will light the fire which will burn all night tradition dictates that a close friend or family member keeps watch through the night i will perform that obligation 
At dawn, I will gather the ashes, put them in a wooden urn, and consign them to the river. Again, Roger translates for the others. I would like to speak, Roger tells Broadtrunk, after getting signs of comprehension, comprehension from the, the crew. Of course, the chieftain nods. Wouldn't anyone else like to say something? I think Roger will speak well enough for all of us, Peregrine replies. <clears throat> Again, the remark is translated and their nods of assent all around. Very well, Broadtrunk observes. It is very nearly sunset. Admiral, if you and the captain would take the corners at his feet, Peregrine and I will take those at his head. Roger translates the instruction for Forge them, and they take their positions. He looks down at Rotvine's body, whose face is a kind of satisfied repose, as if he knew he was about to see his arbor flower again, and she would answer for herself again at long last. Broadtrunk gives the signal as the gloaming descends, and Roger hefts his corner of the beer, surprised by its lightness. They proceed solemnly up the causeway into the temple where torches on iron stanchions burn, illuminating gold and silver mosaics of the flame and river images. The east side of the temple is open to a red-hued and darkening vista of the great forest river, and the ceiling is open to the purple sky. The centerpiece of the room is a large stone altar consisting of a blackened stone grate under which is stacked an enormous amount of wooden fuel, artfully arranged to burn with the greatest intensity. Four small burning torches stand at the four corners of the altar. <clears throat> the bearers pause briefly with the beer before Broadtrunk steers the body onto the altar, head to the north, pointing upriver. Roger, Peregrine, and the Mayor Ermans take the cue from Broadtrunk's household staff to form two parallel ranks of mourners alongside that formed by the Arborians. Broadtrunk himself takes a position in front of the altar. My brothers and sisters, he adds, nodding to the outworlders, we gather now to send our brother Rotvine back into the cosmos from whence we all derive our existence. Before we light the portal of death so that his spirits can find its way, we offer these words of remembrance. Broadtrunk nods to Roger, and steps down to join the rank of Arborean mourners. <clears throat> Roger steps his way carefully before the altar, self-consciously avoiding the hem of, his, of the robe under his four feet. He turns to face the assembly and realizes that he has no idea of what to say. He decides to start with the facts. My friendship, our friendship, he says indicating his company, with Rotvine was a brief but nonetheless profound and memorable one. He notes with some ambivalence that Peregrine is providing a murmured translation to the Mare Urbans. For us, Rodvine was an eloquent ambassador for his people, though he saved his eloquence for his work. Through him and his work we obtained an all too brief glimpse not of Arborean civilization or even culture, but of the Arborean soul, a gift more precious than any treasure. Through him we saw how his people see the unions of earth and sky, fire and water, the seen and unseen. Roger turns toward the beer and gazes on Rodvine's face once more. Thank you, my friend. May you have fair winds on this your last journey. And may you have nectar gel and mare urban wine aplenty when you arrive. Roger turns back to the assembly and steps off the altar to rejoin the ranks of mourners. Rodtrunk solemnly, 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 very seriously, returns to the altar and faces the mourners once again. <clears throat> I was a child when I first met Rotvine, he begins. He was young and vigorous then, just coming into his gifts. Even then his passion for light and glass was intense and fearless. He would journey to the feet of the burning mountains in search of glass with the same lack of fear and singleness of purpose that he would scoop molten glass out of the crucible to give it form and, as our brother just said, eloquence. As I grew and he aged, I realized that he and I shared a vision, a vision we sought to bring to life in different ways, but the same vision nonetheless. Together we believe that our people's destiny is to lead our increasingly shared civilization, here he looks to the outworlders again, toward a more holistic and unified approach to our shared challenges. Broadtrunk pauses, evidently to compose himself. Alas, he continues, only Rotvine remained faithful to that vision in his way, even when I became discouraged and abandoned it. 
and him. The chieftain turns to Rotvine's body. I rededicate myself to that vision here and now, old friend. Go now in peace, and may your spirit light the glass from the burning mountains now and until the end of time. At this, Broadtrent gestures to Roger and the other bearers, and they once again take up their positions around the bier on the altar. He takes a torch in hand, and the other three follow his example. Broadtrunk again faces those assembled. May the river carry his body to rest in the sea. And may the flames carry his spirit to light the sky, the Arboreans reply. Broadtrunk inserts his burning torch into the base of the pile of wood, and the others do the same. They all step back to watch as the flames begin to climb, quickly engulfing the beer and the body. Broadtrunk leads them off the altar where they stand for a time, watching the flames as they leap upward, burning hot and so bright that the flames in the wrought iron stanchions seem to disappear and the golden silver mosaics appear to emerge from the dark walls and hang in the air. Just as the air in the temple grows dangerously hot and the flame is blindingly bright, Broad Trunk passes through the ranks of mourners and the Orborians follow. Roger and his friends follow them. Once outside in the seemingly pitch blackness lit only by the fire within the temple, the mourners remove their robes, and these are gathered by a member of Broadtrunk's staff. Thank you again for coming, the chieftain says, and to Roger, and thank you for your inspiring words. Stout Branch here will take you back to your vessel. I will remain here until dawn to see that Rodvine's passage is complete. It was an honor to be here, Peregrine tells him. Thank you for making that possible. Yes, Roger agrees. We are grateful to you for permitting us to pay him tribute. All gratitude is mine, Broadtrunk replies. Until the morning then. They all climb aboard the transport and ride silently back through the brightly lit and still teeming streets to the spaceport, each lost in his or her own thoughts. When they arrive, Roger thanks Stout Branch and watches him drive off. They all stand around, as if not knowing what to do next, until Peregrine speaks up. Among my people, she says, is the custom to hold a great feast to send off the departed. I say we have such a feast tonight. An excellent idea, Forged M remarks. I'll bring out some more nectar wine, Lutterson volunteers with approving looks from Forged Dam and Gather Dam. And we have more Orborian fruit, Gather Dam adds. And we also have plenty of nectar gel, Roger chimes in. Then it is settled. Let us convene in half hour's time and feast to Rotvine's memory, Forged M commands cheerfully. Roger walks to the freighter, passing the fuel synthesizer and Peregrine's strange weapon into his cabin to retrieve additional nectar, fruit, and gel. While there, he sees the boxes contain the glass bowls he bought from Rotvine. He puts the food in his haversack and carries the boxes back to the outdoor dining table. Peregrine has once again lit the tall torches, and their sight recalls to Roger the evening's events in vivid detail. He opens the boxes and removes the bowls, setting them, setting them out on the table and filling two with the nectar gel and nectar fruit. The third he leaves for the arborean fruit. The torchlight evokes shimmering, muted colors and shapes in the glass, and Roger, remembering his first sight of them, stares dreamily. Are those the ones made by Rotvine? The notice on the goggles startles Roger back to awareness, and he sees that it is Forge Dam who has spoken. Yes, Roger replies. I also bought some sky catchers you made with Mare Urban Glass. They are striking, even if I can't appreciate all the colors, the captain observes. Oh, Rotvine's bowls, the arriving Gather Dam notes approvingly. What a lovely idea, Mr. Roger. She places the vivid arborean fruit in the empty bowl. Nectar wine for all, announces Lutterson, who is accompanied by Forgeson and Nardam, who, like Lutterson, are carrying two one-liter flasks each. Is there room for fungus root and seed gruel? Burroson asks, jovially, as he and Peregrine set those burdens on the table. This is indeed a fine feast, Peregrine observes, as they all take their places after gathering food for their plates. She picks up her flask and waits for all to do likewise, except for Roger, of course, who holds a piece of nectar fruit. To the memory of Rotvine. To the memory of Rotvine, they all repeat before drinking, or in Roger's case, eating. 
The group then falls to eating in a reverent, if masticating, silence. This arborean fruit is really quite tasty, Gatherdam says, simply to break the silence. <clears throat> it's a shame Broadtrunk couldn't get the trade with Mara Herba going. Perhaps we can, Burroson says, once we're done, that is. <clears throat> That's a lovely thought, Peregrine says thoughtfully, being done. Speaking of being done, Forgen remarks impishly, when I'm done, I want an Arborean funeral. As morbid as a thought as that is, Forgen remarks dryly, I agree, and I want Mr. Roger to give the eulogy. As do I, Peregrine concurs, casting an affectionate look in Roger's direction. Yes, Mr. Roger, the normally taciturn Nardam says to him. Those words were beautiful. Well, thank you, Nardam, Roger replies subconsciously. But I sincerely hope that I have no such opportunity. As soon as he says this, Roger realizes with a pang that because of the disparity between Cerulean lifespans and that of Mare Urbans and Nebulans, he is very likely to have many such opportunities. It is a sad thought for a sad day. I wonder if Broderick's rededication to Arborian leadership of the solar system means he'll want to keep his folly, the captain remarks wryly. Is that what he was talking about? I hadn't a clue, Fordson admits freely, his tongue apparently loosened by the wine. That hadn't occurred to me, Roger confesses despondently. This has indeed been a calamitous day. We don't know that he was ever willing to part with a folly, Peregrine notes consolingly. Didn't you say that he promised to help us? Yes, Roger confirms, but adds despondently, but he only agreed to make some inquiries. Well, he seemed genuinely moved by your eulogy, Forge Dam recalls. I think he is truly grateful for our participation and kind treatment of his friend. He strikes me as a person who will make good on his word or better. How long does it take a nectar blossom plant to mature, Paragon asked Roger, from seed to producing gel? What? Roger asks in consternation. I don't see what that has to do with anything. How long does it take? Peregrine insists gently. Well, the wild varieties can take three seasons, Roger answers impatiently. The hybrids can be productive in two. We've only been here for four days, Peregrine tells him. Let's give the seeds we planted some time to germinate. Not all seeds that germinate produce gel and fruit, Roger counters bleakly. One step at a time, my friend. One step at a time. So that ends chapter 14. Chapter 15 is called The Rotbinder. So, thanks very much for watching and listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to contact me with any questions about anything. Have a good night, a good day, good evening.